The Mongol military tactics and organization enabled the Mongol Empire to conquer nearly all of continental Asia, the Middle East and parts of Eastern Europe. The original foundation of that system was an extension of the nomadic lifestyle of the Mongols. Other elements were invented by Genghis Khan, his generals, and his successors. Technologies useful to attack fortifications were adapted from other cultures, and foreign technical experts integrated into the command structures. For the larger part of the 13th century, the Mongols lost only a few battles using that system, and always returned to turn the result around in their favor. In many cases, they won against significantly larger opposing armies. Their first defeat in the West came in 1223 at the Battle of Samara Bend by the hands of the Volga Bulgars. The second one was at the Battle of Angel Lut in 1260, against the First Army which had been specifically trained to use their own tactics against them. But again they would return over 40 years later and defeat the Egyptian Mamluks at the Battle of Wadi al-Khazanda in 1299 and annexed Syria. Palestine as well as Gaza. The Mongols suffered defeats in attempted invasions of Vietnam and Japan. But while the empire became divided around the same time, its combined size and influence remained largely intact for more than another hundred years organization. In accordance with Mongol civil and social structure, outstanding obedience and firm discipline provided the backbone for their military. According to Italian explorer Giovanni da Pian del Caprine, the Tatars, that is, the Mongols are the most obedient people in the world in regard to their leaders, more so even than our own clergy to their superiors. They hold them in the greatest reverence and never tell them a lie. Army delegates were chosen either by their blood association of the Khan family or by military-related meritocracy. Each delegate received responsibility in their respective titles. Transfers between units were forbidden. The leaders on each level had significant license to execute their orders in the way they considered best. This command structure proved to be highly flexible and allowed the Mongol army to attack en masse, divide into somewhat smaller groups to encircle and lead enemies into an ambush, or divide into small groups of ten to mop up a fleeing and broken army. Individual soldiers were responsible for their equipment, weapons, and up to five mounts, although they fought as part of a unit. Their families and herds would accompany them on foreign expeditions. Above all units, there existed an elite force called Kashyyyk. They functioned as imperial guard of the Mongol Empire as well as a training ground for potential young officers. The great Subutai having started his career there, mobility each Mongol soldier typically maintained three or four horses. Changing horses often allowed them to travel at high speed for days without stopping or wearing out the animals. Their ability to live off the land, and in extreme situations off their animals, made their armies far less dependent on the traditional logistical apparatus of agrarian armies. In some cases, as during the invasion of Hungary in early 1241, they covered up to 100 miles per day, which was unheard of by other armies of the time. The mobility of individual soldiers made it possible to send them on successful scouting missions, gathering intelligence about routes and searching for terrain suited to the preferred combat tactics of the Mongols. During the invasion of Kiev in Rus, the Mongols used frozen rivers as highways, and winter, the time of year usually off-limits for any major activity due to the intense cold, became the Mongols' preferred time to strike. To avoid the deadly hail of missiles, enemies would frequently spread out, or seek cover, breaking up their formations and making them more vulnerable to the lance's charges. Likewise, when they packed themselves together, into dense square or phalanx-style formations, they would become more vulnerable to the arrows. Once the enemy was deemed sufficiently weakened, the Noyans would give the order. The drums would beat and the signal flags wave, telling the lances to begin the charge. Often, the devastation of the arrows was enough to rout an enemy, so the lances were only needed to help pursue and mop up the remnants. 
when facing European armies, whose emphasis was in formations of heavy cavalry, the Mongols would avoid direct confrontation, and would instead use their bows to destroy enemy cavalry at long distances. If the armor withstood their arrows, the Mongols killed the knight's horses, leaving a heavily armored man on foot and isolated. At the Battle of Mohi, the Mongols left open a gap in their ranks, luring the Hungarians into retreating through it. This resulted in the Hungarians being strung out over all the countryside and easy pickings for mounted archers who simply galloped along and picked them off while the lancers skewered them as they fled. At Legnica, a few Teutonic, Templar and Hospitaller knights were dismounted due to loss of horses. Their lack of mobility in arches ensured their sound defeat all the same. Training and discipline Mongol armies practiced horsemanship, archery, and unit tactics, formations and rotations over and over again. This training was maintained by a hard, but not overly harsh or unreasonable, discipline. Officers and troopers alike were usually given a wide leeway by their superiors in carrying out their orders. So long as the larger objectives of the plan were well served and the orders promptly obeyed, the Mongols thus avoided the pitfalls of overly rigid discipline and micromanagement which have proven a hobgoblin to armed forces throughout history. However, all members had to be unconditionally loyal to each other and to their superiors, and especially to the Khan. If one soldier ran from danger in battle, then he and his nine comrades from the same Arban would face the death penalty together. Cavalry six of every ten Mongol troopers were like cavalry horse archers, the remaining four were more heavily armored and armed lances. Mongol light cavalry were extremely light troops compared to contemporary standards, allowing them to execute tactics and maneuvers that would have been impractical for a heavier enemy. Most of the remaining troops were heavier cavalry with lances for close combat after the archers had brought the enemy into disarray. Soldiers usually carried scimitars or battle axes as well. The Mongols protected their horses in the same way as did they themselves, covering them with lamella armor. Horse armor was divided into five parts and designed to protect every part of the horse, including the forehead, which had a specially crafted plate which was tied on each side of the neck. Mongolian horses are relatively small, but extremely hardy, self-sufficient and long-winded. These horses could survive in climates that would have killed other breeds, enabling the Mongols to launch successful winter attacks on Russia. Mongol horses typically do not require a daily supply of grain. Their ability to forage grass and twigs on their own, and to survive on such fodder, helped free the Khan's army from the need for supply lines. The Mongol horse has excellent stamina. In 30 kilometers traditional races between Mongol horses and breeds like the Arabian or Thoroughbred, it has been found that the latter are faster, but that Mongol horses are better able to run at length. Seen as a machine of war, the Mongol horse is an all-terrain, all-weather vehicle requiring little gas or maintenance and providing excellent mileage. A warrior relied on his herd to provide him with staple foods of milk and meat, hide for bowstrings, shoes, and dharma of dry dung to be used as fuel for his fire, hair for rope, battle standards musical instruments and helmet decorations, milk also used for shamanistic ceremonies to ensure victory, and for hunting and entertainment that often served as military training. If he died in battle, a horse would sometimes be sacrificed with him to provide a mount for the afterlife. The main drawback to Mongol horses was their lack of speed. They would lose short-distance races under equal conditions with larger horses from other regions. However, since most other armies carried much heavier armor, the Mongols could still outrun most enemy horsemen in battle. In addition, Mongolian horses were extremely durable and sturdy, allowing the Mongols to move over large distances quickly, often surprising enemies that had expected them to arrive days or even weeks later. All horses were equipped with stirrups. This technical advantage made it easier for the Mongol archers to turn their upper body and shoot in all directions, including backwards. 
Mongol warriors would time the losing of an arrow to the moment when a galloping horse would have all four feet off the ground, thus ensuring a steady, well-aimed shot. Each soldier had two to four horses so when a horse tired they could use the other ones which made them one of the fastest armies in the world. This, however, also made the Mongol army vulnerable to shortages of fodder. Campaigning in arid or forested regions were thus difficult and even in ideal step. Terrain a Mongol force had to keep moving in order to ensure sufficient grazing for its massive horse herd. Logistics Supply the Mongol armies traveled very light, and were able to live largely off the land. Their equipment included fish hooks and other tools meant to make each warrior independent of any fixed supply source. The most common travel food of the Mongols was dried and ground meat, borts, which is still common in the Mongolian cuisine today. Borts is light and easy to transport, and can be cooked with water similarly to a modern, instant soup. To ensure they would always have fresh horses, each trooper usually had three or four mounts. The horse is viewed much like a cow in Mongolia, and is milked and slaughtered for meat as such. Since most of the Mongols' mounts were mares, they were able to live off their horses' milk or milk products as they moved through enemy territory. In dire straits, the Mongol warrior could drink some of the blood from his string of remounts. They could survive a whole month only by drinking mare's milk combined with mare's blood. Heavier equipment was brought up by well-organized supply trains. Wagons and carts carried, amongst other things, large stockpiles of arrows. The main logistical factor limiting their advance was finding enough food and water for their animals. This would lead to serious difficulties during some of the Mongol campaigns, such as their conflicts with the Mamluks, the arid terrain of Syria and the Levant making it difficult for large Mongol armies to penetrate the region, especially given the Mamluks' scorched earth policy of burning grazing lands throughout the region. It also limited the Mongol ability to exploit their success following the Battle of Mohi, as even the Great Hungarian Plain was not large enough to provide grazing for all the flocks and herds following Subutai's army permanently. Communications The Mongols established a system of postal relay horse stations, similar to the system employed in ancient Persia for fast transfer of written messages. The Mongol mail system was the first such empire-wide service since the Roman Empire. Additionally, Mongol battlefield communication utilized signal flags and horns and to a lesser extent, signal arrows to communicate movement orders during combat. Costume The basic costume of the Mongol fighting man consisted of a heavy coat fastened at the waist by a leather belt. From the belt would hang his sword, dagger, and possibly an axe. This long robe-like coat would double over, left breast over right, and be secured with a button a few inches below the right armpit. The coat was lined with fur. Underneath the coat, a shirt-like undergarment with long, wide sleeves was commonly worn. Silk and metallic thread were increasingly used. The Mongols wore protective heavy silk undershirts. Even if an arrow pierced their male or leather outer garment, the silk from the undershirt would stretch to wrap itself around the arrow as it entered the body, reducing damage caused by the arrow shaft, and making removal of the arrow easier. The boots were made from felt and leather and though heavy would be comfortable and wide enough to accommodate the trousers tucked in before lacing, tightly. They were heelless, though the soles were thick and lined with fur. Worn with felt socks, the feet were unlikely to get cold. Lamella armor was worn over the thick coat. The armor was composed of small scales of iron, chain mail, or hard leather sewn together with leather tongs and could weigh 10 kilograms if made of leather alone and more if the cuirass was made of metal. Scales the leather was first softened by boiling and then coated in a crude lacquer made from pitch, which rendered it waterproof. Sometimes the soldier's heavy coat was simply reinforced with metal plates. Helmets were cone-shaped and composed of iron or steel plates of different sizes and included iron platter neck guards. The Mongol cap was conical in shape and made of quilted material with a large turned-up brim, reversible in winter, and ear muffs. 
Whether a soldier's helmet was leather or metal depended on his rank and wealth. Weapons Mounted arches were a major part of the armies of the Mongol Empire, for instance at the 13th century Battle of Liegnitz, where an army including 20,000 horse archers defeated a force of 30,000 armored troops led by Henry II, Duke of Silesia, via demoralization and continued harassment. Mongol bow The primary weapon of the Mongol forces was their composite bows are made from laminated horn, wood, and sinew. The layer of horn is on the inner face as it resists compression, while the layer of sinew is on the outer face as it resists tension. Such bows, with minor variations, had been the main weapon of steppe herdsmen and steppe warriors for over two millennia. Mongols were extremely skilled with them. Some were said to be able to hit a bird on the wing. Composite construction allows a powerful and relatively efficient bow to be made small enough that it can be used easily from horseback. Quivers containing 60 arrows were strapped to the backs of the cavalrymen and to their horses. Mongol archers typically carried two to three bows that were accompanied by multiple quivers and files for sharpening their arrowheads. These arrowheads were hardened by plunging them in brine after first heating them red hot. The Mongols could shoot an arrow over 200 meters. Targeted shots were possible at a range of 150 or 175 meters, which determined the optimal tactical approach distance for light cavalry units. Ballistic shots could hit enemy units at distances of up to 400 meters. Useful for surprising and scaring troops and horses before beginning the actual attack. Shooting from the back of a moving horse may be more accurate if the arrow is loosed in the phase of the gallop when all four of the horse's feet are off the ground. The Mongols may have also used crossbows, also both for infantry and cavalry, but these were scarcely ever seen or used in battle. The Manchus forbade archery by their Mongol subjects, and the Mongolian bow-making tradition was lost. The present bow-making tradition emerged after independence in 1921 and is based on Manchu types of bow, somewhat different to the bows known to have been used by the Mongol Empire. Mounted archery had fallen into disuse and has been revived only in the 21st century. Sword Mongol swords were a slightly curved scimitar which was used for slashing attacks but was also capable of cutting and thrusting due to its shape and construction, making it easier to use from horseback. The sword could be used with a one-handed or two-handed grip and had a blade that was usually around 2.5 feet in length, with the overall length of the sword approximately a 1 meter. Fire weapons and gunpowder Several modern scholars have speculated that Chinese firearms and gunpowder weapons were deployed by the Mongols at the Battle of Mohi. Reliable sources mention weapons like flaming arrows and naphtha bombs being used against not just the Hungarian army but also against the Persians. It is well documented that the Mongols used cannons and bombs during the invasions of Japan, which were an early example of gunpowder warfare in action. One of the most notable weapons the Mongols used during the invasions was explosive bombs. A mounted samurai being attacked with these bombs is depicted on a Japanese scroll. Catapults and machines technology was one of the important facets of Mongolian warfare. For instance, siege machines were an important part of Genghis Khan's warfare, especially in attacking fortified cities. The siege engines were not disassembled and carried by horses to be rebuilt at the site of the battle, as was the usual practice with European armies. Instead the Mongol horde would travel with skilled engineers who would build siege engines from materials on site. The engineers building the machines were recruited among captives, mostly from China and Persia. When Mongols slaughtered whole populations, they often spared the engineers, swiftly assimilating them into the Mongol armies. Engineers in Mongol service displayed a considerable degree of ingenuity in planning. During a siege of a fortified Chinese city the defenders had taken care to remove all large rocks from the region to deny the Mongols an ammunition supply for their trebuchets. 
but the Mongol engineers resorted to cutting up logs which they soaked in water to make suitably heavy spheres. During the siege of the assassin's fortress of Alamut, the Mongols gathered large rocks from far and wide, piling them up in depots a day's journey from one another all the way to their siege lines so that a huge supply was available for the breaching batteries operating against the mighty citadel. The Mongols also scouted the hills around the city to find suitable higher ground on which to mount ballistas manned by Qatan engineers allowing these to snipe into the interior of the fortress. The Mongols made effective use of the siege technologies developed by their subject peoples. Genghis Khan utilized the Chinese engineers and traction trebuchets he had gained from his victories over the Jurchens and Tanguts during his Khwarezmian campaign, while Kublai Khan later called upon Muslim engineers from his Ilkhanate cousins to build counterweight trebuchets that finally concluded the six-year siege of Fan Cheng and Zhang Yang. Karish a commonly used tactic was the use of what was called the Karish. During a siege the Mongols would gather a crowd of local residents or soldiers surrendered from previous battles, and would drive them forward in sieges and battles. These living boards, or human shields, would often take the brunt of enemy arrows and crossbow bolts, thus leaving the Mongol warriors safer. The Karash were also often forced ahead to breach walls, 